as unqualified as we may be, we want to talk about the kingdom of God. We know that in the Lord's Prayer we pray, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But one thing I want to make clear is that the church is not the responsible or even capable agent of making heaven on earth. John said, and Behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And he that sits on the throne, he says, Behold, I make all things new. Everything is not going to be just patched up, no band-aids, there's no plaster pair of slings or anybody's signature hanging on us uh, that we were reminiscent with or had acquaintances with during the time on earth. It's going to be new. It's going to be totally absolutely new. But what is a kingdom? Well, it has a king. <laughs> yeah, kingdom has a king. Who is our king? Our king would be, my king would be Jesus. I hope your king is, but uh, when he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, it seems like, well, isn't that a no-brainer? No, it's not a no-brainer. It's because there is another kingdom in competition. It's actually been defeated. The prince of this world has been judged, the devil. He actually really truly has lost the battle and that was manifested at the resurrection of Christ from the dead. He was declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead by the Holy Spirit. And just FYI, Jesus did not arm wrestle his way out of hell or Hades or Tartaros, or Sheol, or Bosom of Abraham, or, uh, you know, Paradise, which he said to the thief on the cross, this day shalt thou be with me in Paradise. No, Jesus actually didn't, um, he didn't escape under his own strength. He did, was accomplished by his own will, because it concorded, or it was in alignment with the will of Father, of the Father. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down on myself. This commandment, I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is not an independent act of the Son of God arm wrestling the devil and winning and getting out of hell. When he died on the cross, he said to his Father, into your hands I commend or commit my spirit. So we know that it was in God's keeping. We read from Ephesians that he had descended into the lower parts of the earth. Well, that's right because there were people waiting for him, like maybe Job. What do you say? I know my Redeemer liveth and he shall stand on the earth at the latter day. He even mentioned previously that though this body be consumed, my reins be consumed within me, the worms destroy my flesh. Yet in this body, in this flesh, naturaleza, I shall see God, my eye shall behold him and not another, for I know that my Redeemer shall stand upon the earth in the latter day. And the fulfillment of that, of Job's resurrection prophecy, or messianic prophecy, if you will, was that uh, Jesus is coming to earth and he came. The only thing is, Job died many, many, many years before he came. The Sabians who were listed in the first chapter of Job as a people that came in and destroyed his family. And it was one of the things that um, uh, came against Job in his, his test. Let's call it his test. Uh, because God was rather proud of Job. He said to the devil, okay, understand this. Not everybody, it said there was a day when the sons of God were gathered together and Satan was there. That does not mean that Satan is a son of God. Angels are not sons of God. Angels in their first state, estate, are not sons of God. Fallen angels, to whom is reserved the mist of the darkness, wandering stars, uh, who, to whom is reserved the mist of the darkness for ever, ever and ever, or those angels that are chained under darkness. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they are not sons of God. Uh, as a matter of fact, nobody, nobody ever in any creation can, can configure themselves into being a son of God. It only happens when you and I are born again. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Do we have a personality in the flesh? Yes, you are who you are. But when you get born again, that person is symbolically 
and spiritually he's crucified with Christ. In other words, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It doesn't mean that I have disappeared or ceased to exist. I am still that same person, but I have been redeemed. That means bought again. I've been bought back. And uh, I want you to know that it was not like a legal contract. Salvation is not just a ransom from the devil. I don't give him that much credit. What salvation did for me was reconcile me to God. And I'm not saying that some of the collateral benefits are not being redeemed from the devil. I am. I'm, I'm bought with a price, so I'm not my own. <coughs> Excuse me. Therefore, uh, this body that used to lend itself to ungodly purposes, now these hands that stole, they can steal no more. They don't have to steal. I can work with my hands and provide for the loss for those that are without. Uh, the mouth that I have, the mind, the lung, the coordination of uh, articulation, I don't have to curse God anymore. Uh, and vainly take the, the Lord's name in vain, using it as if he doesn't exist or it doesn't matter. No, I now have a proper use of my bodily functions, okay? And so it's not to be in the flesh, just means sin is not organic. I'm sorry for all you people that were baptized as a baby and you think that uh, organically you are in now. No, no, that's not, no. If, if you've been using your body for unrighteousness, then you are unrighteous. Whoever servants you are, whether it's of righteousness to sin or unrighteousness, um, you're that servant of that. <coughs> we are the servants of whatever we serve. Excuse me. Sorry about the cough. But a kingdom has a king, and King Jesus is the victorious king. He said, all power is given unto me. He won the battle, okay? And we have witness of that by also God. Uh, I know God the Father performed the works when he was dead. God the Father brought again our Lord Jesus from the dead as a sign that, yes, yes, there was a sign when the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and he said, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. But there was also a sign... Uh, the scribes or the religious people and Pharisees, they complained to Christ that he was like testifying of himself, which is blasphemy. To blasphemy simply means to take a common, ordinary um, dirtbag person and say, oh, I'm God. You know, Caesar did it. And, you know, uh, I, I guess uh, Diocletian or whoever the last one was did it. <coughs> I don't think Julius did it. He believed in despotism, that he was there for God, for the purpose of God, but it got to the point where the Caesars were calling themselves God. I am, I am uh, Diocletian, I am God. And that was rather pitiful. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the people that ruled Rome, e even the political hacks who got in, like Herod was a political hack who bought his way. Pilate was a political hack. Um, I forget what he was before he was a, uh, a political guy, but he he just bought his way into a kingdom. The Edomites uh, did that. The Edomites had a long-standing, oh, what do you want to say, feud? They had a problem, okay, with the Jews. Uh, what we have is um, is we have Jacob and Esau fighting together, okay? Jesaw, or Esau, Esau. Even though Jacob was a deceiver and uh, he stole his brother's birthright, um, his brother sold it, you know, and... and uh, he sold it lock, stock, and barrel because a few moments of pleasure in the flesh was more important to him than the spiritual domain and, uh, and uh, his spiritual destiny. Didn't matter that much to him. Like, yeah, sure, you can have my birthright for a pottage. What's it, you know, what good does it do me if I'm dead? Or uh, in the temptation of this world, sexual temptation? Sure, I can go ahead, adultery, fornication, there's no problem with those things. I, uh, a little bit of pleasure, you know, why, why not? What, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Um, bad advice, very, very, very bad advice. And uh, there's a God in heaven. When David wrote in Psalm, I think it was Psalm 3, he says, if the foundations be destroyed, what are the righteous going to do? Nobody believes like that anymore. Everybody just believes in living for themselves. Look at the politicians that lead us. It's nothing about us. It's all about them. And uh, what are the righteous going to do? <coughs> Excuse me. But the verse right after that is very clear. 
It says the Lord is on his throne beholding everything. His eyes see everything. He knows. So really, I hate to tell you, but you know, God is in charge, not you and not me. All right. You can, um, you can, you, you can live your life the way you want to live, but not for as long as you want. Okay. You can do what you want and go, what, go where you want and say what you want and act like you want, but not for as long as you want. Uh, there is a day of reconciliation of judgment and it's a day, um, it's natural. It has to be. There's no way around judgment. It's part of God's personality, but that's just the father and the son has come here and look at the horrendous things that Jesus, my king, suffered. Humility, debasement, uh, ridicule, he, and, and that still goes on, by the way. Even though he's still washing my feet, which are the saints of the church, uh, of course symbolically, but with the washing of the water of the word, he's still ridiculed. He's called a hater because he just tells it like it is. You know, Jesus, I don't know that he was a... Uh, I'd have to say he's probably not a politically compliant or complacent person. He was somebody that people really despised because he said things that people hated to hear or some people hated, okay? But um, there is another, of course, he has been crucified. The scripture says, I believe in the book of Acts, he went about doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. And we also read that the same Jesus was crucified as a criminal, as a criminal, okay? Um, his charge, the Jews charged him with blasphemy because he, you know, did things. Uh, they said to him, you know, you talk about God being your father, that's kind of blasphemous, that's kind of uppity uppity, isn't it? Isn't that kind of bold of you or don't you think a little more highly than you ought? And no, if he was a human being thinking that, well, of course the answer would be yeah. But he did not consider himself he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God because he was God the Son. And uh, he was here as, as, as uh, the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. But he did mention to the scribes, the religious people getting back on track here, was uh, he said, no, I have more than one witness, even your law, which really isn't their law, it's the law of Moses. It says, let every word be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses, or two or more witnesses. Well, he said, uh, I'm one that give witness of myself, and the Father gives witness. He bears witness because the works that I do. I mean, look at all the things that are happening. So there's two right there. And I want you to say that, or I want to say to you, that Jesus even added, added a third person to the Godhead in his conversation. He did it to his disciples. The scribes had written, you know, the Spirit of God is upon me, for he hath anointed me to... Uh, to preach glad tidings. <clears throat> and they were familiar with what the Spirit of God was, but not as a personality, not as a person. But Jesus told his disciples, he said, uh, I have to go away. Because if I don't go, the Spirit, the Comforter, the Counselor, Consolador, he's not going to come unless I go. But when I go, the Father is going to send him in my absence because... Uh, he's going to teach you all things, the things. There are so many things I would say to you now, but you can't grasp them, okay? And when he comes, he's going to explain them to you. You're going to get it. He's going to compare spiritual with spiritual. This is the Holy Spirit. And we know that, of course, the Holy Spirit descended on him. We saw it like a dove. And he was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert to be, uh, it just said, where he was tempted of the devil. And uh, because God doesn't tempt us with evil, by the way, but uh, uh, we're in the world, but we're not of it. That's why it says, lead us not into temptation. The temptation comes from us. When we get ourselves in precarious situations that um, could have been avoided, you could not maybe have gone down that street or, uh, you know, done the, taken the deal you took which led to another thing, which led to another thing, which led to another thing. Just let God open and close doors for you. It's a very good idea. But Jesus is talking about not only is there God the Father and God the Son, now he's introducing God the Holy Spirit. He's going to come here and be the, um, the... There's really nothing exact that you can say, you know, well, like it's like uh, ice and... Uh, 
or it's like water and gas and ice, three, no, that would be three forms of the same H2O, uh, you know, solid, liquid, gas. These are not three, this is not one personality in three persons. This is three persons in three persons and three persons as divine one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is, well, the word used is achad in the, in the Greek, and uh, the Lord thy God is one. Not only does it mean one singularly or in compound he's one, it also means he's the only one, okay? <laughs> he's the only God. And you can worship yourself and worship your, your entertainment world and worship your money and worship your, your job and worship education and worship technology and uh, worship all these kind of things. But um, yeah, go ahead, have fun. <laughs> they're not going to save you. They're not going to do anything for you. You know, really, uh, they're not going to deliver you from hell. That's for sure. But the benefit of um, righteousness is that it does deliver you from hell, okay? We can put, put on the righteousness of Christ. So you've got the Holy Spirit also. Uh, like I said, there's nothing. People say, well, how about, how, how about an egg? An egg has a shell and an egg white and a yolk. <sighs> Not really. I mean, if you're looking for three in one, eh, you know, okay, um, you know, that might work for some things, but you're going to find applications where it doesn't. Uh, one that is a little more effective, but not as detailed, and that is um, uh, there is a will maker, and that is God, and there is a testator who died, that's the son, and there is an executor of the will. And if you've gone through family deaths and you know about probate and things like that, there's an executor who actually sees that the will that was written uh, regarding the testator who died is actually activated, actually put in place and, you know, brought to pass. And this would be, uh, this would be the Holy Spirit. He is a, if I can say this, and like I say, well, what about this situation? He couldn't do that. I agree. There's a lot of things. I, I, I don't really know that there is an earthly, um, accurate symbolism that takes the Godhead to a detail. It's a kind of a, it's a very unnatural mentally concept but the, the, the dilemma you cannot get away with. Not understanding the Trinity is like having, having a particular shape missing out of a jigsaw puzzle. I don't do jigsaw puzzles. I, I don't have patience for them. But uh, I do know people who do, you know, and they've been on the table for a month, you know, or a year or whatever. Like, you know, I don't, you know, and it used to be the old jigsaw puzzles didn't have pictures on the covers of the boxes. You just like, Okay, all these colors and maybe blue is the sky and this is the grass or what, whatever. You just did the best you could, but the shapes assisted. I have noticed in, in reading, I mean uh, reading, not just casual reading, but really combing through the New Testament, escudrinando, we would say, uh, going through the, uh, or the entire Bible, um, there's some like, wow, what peace goes here? How does this happen? How does in the beginning, the gods, he made the heavens and the earth and where's the plurality and why the singular and why is God, uh, saying, uh, to Moses in narration, cause he was born 400 years after the book of Genesis, let us make, uh, who's he talking? Who does, when God says, let us, who's he talking to? And they say, oh, well, he's talking to the angels. No, there's no image of angels in my person. That's for sure. I'm a man. I mean, men, God made man in his image. There's no angel in me. That's for sure. Ask, that's my wife and my friends, you know, that's not there. Uh, they say, well, okay, he's speaking um, like, uh, what do they call that? Majestic plural. You know, we say, thus saith the queen or the king. Well, that has a very well-known origin. And it's because when people, when the king comes out and says, we have decided, he's not just speaking for himself. He's speaking for his lineage, for all the kings before him. And, you know, the idea is, we're all a bunch of despots, actually, and it's been handed down, so I'm here. So we, as a lineage or a kingship over, over this kingdom, <clears throat> we declare, you know, that you can't eat boiled peanuts or whatever it could be, but they speak in that, you know, form. And that's, that's a very well-known, established, and accepted grammatical form of speech. <clears throat> but it includes your, your, uh, it, it includes your lineage and God does not have 
a lineage. There is no God before him. There's no God like him or now, and there will be no God after him. He is Alpha. He is Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. And he is the only, only, only God. You and I are not gods. I've heard that ridiculous twisting or forcing of verses. Uh, let's see, what are they at? Spinning, spinning the word of God. Oh, it's a little G, but we are still gods. Um, okay, have fun. <laughs> when do you meet the real one? You're going to know that, uh, wow, that he's the only one to whom belongs honor and glory and power forever and ever. It's not us. It's him. And uh, so <clears throat> Jesus has made it very clear that the executor of the Holy Spirit here in this world, as far as operation of his kingdom, because I know we're jumping around a lot, but I'm still talking about the kingdom of God. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is actually the dominion of God over the hearts of men. That's what it is right now, okay? It is the dominion of the Spirit of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Angels are not sons of God. You say, well, what about the, you know, verse, you can jump back to Genesis uh, 6, 4, um, and God saw that, the, no, no, so, well, up before it says that the daughters of uh that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And then there's all this, um, it's not apocryphal, what is it? Uh, we don't even know who wrote the book of Enoch, uh, all right? When you read Jude, I said that because that's where that doctrine about angels having sex with women and women giving birth to giants in the land. And if you haven't heard it, fine, it's garbage, it's basura. It's not, it's not you know, the height of these things. Somebody who's 450 feet tall, you think he could walk? I mean, could you imagine the gravitational pull on somebody that's that tall here standing on earth where we have a known, he, you know, if you're overweight and you hike, it's a problem, you know, but could you imagine weighing, weighing hundreds of tons trying to walk around? You couldn't do it. I mean, you, you don't, we had human flesh, human muscle, it doesn't have the um, it doesn't have the elasticity or the mechanism to actually you can't lift tons and tons and tons and you say you know well they were giants they had lots and lots of muscle tissues no it attributes these as being men of renown and their renown simply means somebody famous somebody somebody who exceeds the normal. It doesn't mean they can leap a tall building at a single bound. It doesn't mean bullets bounce off their chest. It doesn't mean what is described in the book of Enoch by giants. Those things, um, you know, they, they, and be, besides that, my topic is not the, the, the ridiculousness of giants. Oh, there have been people 10 feet tall and stuff like that. Yeah, there actually have. And that's considered a giant, you know, but like, oh, come on, 450 feet? How do you, how do you stand? How do you take a step? How do you distribute your weight on something the size of a proportionately consistent foot to the human frame? You can't do it. It just doesn't, it, it, a basic, a basic architect can figure out that something like that, you know, they can't swing swords and sling stones and, and things like that. It's just not, it, it, it won't work. But back, to, uh, but back to the book of Enoch and the sons of God, I won't go through it now. Perhaps we'll do a thing. They're the children of Seth, okay? Cain killed his brother Abel. Why? Because Abel was righteous. Uh, yes, and Cain was wicked, and he slew his brother over that. He was jealous. He was envious of that, not jealousy, but he was envy uh, of that. He was a wicked person, and he was banned for his wickedness, and he had a descendancy, and you can read it. It comes, I know, after a few generations. Uh, you've got two lineages. You've got Cain, and uh, who um, was exiled, and then you had a person by the name of Seth who actually took the place of Adam. You can show it in scripture. We'll walk through it one of these days. But what I'm saying is that angels are not capable of sex. The devil has no sex. Is there any, any record or, uh, or any uh, thing that infers that there are 
baby angels in heaven, that angels are multiplying, that they have a population that is growing. I know one thing, Jesus made it very clear that they don't marry and, and uh, uh, they, they don't, they're like, you remember the guy who, the guys, the religious guys that gave the parable uh, to Jesus about this guy that had a wife and he died. And according to the law, the brother had to come in and raise up seed because of, it all dealt with inheritance of that thing. And there were seven brothers and they all went through one woman and nobody, uh, nobody really uh, was a, able to raise up seed or have a child through this woman for the purpose of inheritance under the Mosaic law. So they said, in the resurrection, whose wife is she going to be? And Jesus said, no, they're not going to be married in the resurrection. They're going to be like the angels. They aren't given marriage. Okay. And if you go back and you read that story back in Genesis, it talks about, it talks about the sons of God. It didn't say they were just looking for, for sexual objects. They took unto them wives, wives. Wives is different, okay? If you're marrying somebody to be your wife, any college kid knows that there are party girls, and then they're the kind of girl you want to bring home to meet mom and dad, okay? Very different, okay? And the idea that angels are actually taking wives to themselves, and first of all, there's no way that that which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. How do you know if they saw them that, that they were desirous, what kind of temptations exist in angelic bodies? Is it the same? My flesh, I know my temptations, adultery, fornication, murder, theft, covetousness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Jesus clearly outlined the tendencies and propensities of my flesh that defile me. He made it very clear. But an angel, is he subject to all those things? He's not made out of what I'm made of. He's not even like me. Go through Hebrews, where the author, who is Paul, by the way, because Timothy's joining with him at the end. I don't care what the scholars say. Uh, Paul, uh, the, the Hebrew mentality is saying who they were always spoken to by angels. That's how they were communicated with in the Old Testament, even the burning bush and all that stuff. Uh, but the idea that uh, we had been spoken to in the past by angels, our fathers, but in these last days, no, this was flesh and blood. This was the Son of God who came here. We call it the incarnation. And it's, um, it's very complete, very detailed and marvelous and very true and very necessary. Jesus didn't come here as an angel with sparks from his fingertips where he could, when an angel of the Lord outside of Jerusalem killed 180,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. That's, that's, that's pretty tough. He's a tough guy, okay? You know, <coughs> um, no, but God did not pick somebody like that to redeem man. He picked somebody for there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Well, wasn't he God? Yes, 100% God, 100% man. If you think Jesus was like a mixture, you know, like he was God on uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and he was a man Saturday, Sunday, and uh, Tuesday or something. No, no, no. He was verily God and verily man. As from his father, his divinity was 100%, and from his mother, his humanity was 100%. And you say, well, that's because you don't want to talk about about the Virgin Mary having sex and things like that that are not appropriate inside the church. My gosh, it was God's idea to fill the world, to multiply and fill the world. It wasn't the devil's idea, but I'm telling you that it was important and necessary for Jesus to be born in a physical body in the flesh, born under the law, born of a woman in, in the flesh. And he was even tempted in all points, just like you and me, yet he was without sin. What's the, why is that necessary? Because guess who's going to sit on the throne? Guess who's the judge? Guess who's coming to judge the quick and the dead? Guess who that is? It's going to be Jesus. Why is it Jesus? Because he knows humiliation. He knows rejection. He's been lied about. He's been beaten. He's been ridiculed. He's been, he's, he's been through mock trials. Uh, he's been crucified. Everything you could say, oh God, yeah, you don't know what it was like. People, they laughed at me as a kid. <sighs> yeah. You don't think Jesus was ever laughed at? You don't think he was mocked? Uh, no, no, he's got the extreme of everything you could imagine. So who better qualifies, really, really, seriously, who qualifies 
to judge another person better than somebody who's been through the same experience. I've been a human being, I've been flesh and blood, they cut me and I bled, they pulled my beard out and it hurt, you know, or even that's just the physical stuff. What about the shame? Oh, I was so ashamed of myself. Yeah, I know what shame is. You know how much sin I had to bear on the cross? You know what, you know what going to the cross is? It's not just a shame of being hung naked before the world as a, as a, as a petty criminal. It's also that the sins that you bore, the penalty of your sins, or let's go back to the garden, the cup of suffering for that, I'm drinking it. I had to drink it. I had to take every sin, everything that you thought, everything that you said, every act that you you intended, everybody that you did something to, every 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 cause of everything ugly in the world, every tear, every heartbeat, every depression, uh, every divorce, every suicide, every it all was put into one, one, one propitiation, and his name was Jesus. And here, because God doesn't give anything away, okay? There is no, <laughs> there's nothing free. There's no free lunch, like Milton Freeman would say. No, salvation was, let me say it like this. This is kind of a saying that it's free, but it's not cheap, okay? It's all paid for. What he gave on Calvary was exacted. My sin, or I should say the penalty for my sin, was exacted out of his body. And that was, wow, that was tremendously, whew, uh, I can't imagine. I mean, I've been ashamed of myself, caught in a lie. And oh my gosh, I feel, I, I feel like I want to crawl under a rock. I, I never want to, you know, be seen again. Could you imagine all the shame of all the sin of the world just like dumped on you and here you are before God? Because God was present, okay? You can go into the cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But uh, that is a quote of Psalm 22, verse one. Of course, Jesus knew why he was there. That would be so unscriptural to say, well, what am I, why are you crucifying me? What am I dying for? Why, why was I delivered unto the Gentiles? Why was I spit upon? Why was I crucified? Why were my hands and feet pierced? Why do they cast lots for my vesture? Why have I come down into the jaws of death? You think he didn't know why he was on the cross? Of course he knew. So when he's saying, my God, my God, why is thou forsaking me? Trust me. He's not asking a question that he doesn't know the answer to. He understands very clearly that he is the Lamb of God and he is taking away the sin of the world. It's not new to him. It's he, he did, his mind didn't just go you know, blank and have amnesia like as they put him on the cross. He knew his purpose from beginning to end. Why do you think he sweat drops of blood in the garden when it came down to him as the son of man, verily human, verily man, verily God, and verily man? Why do you think he sweat drops of blood, you know? You know, capillary hemorrhaging, that doesn't come because, you know, like mom didn't pack you a good school lunch or something. That's like, Wow, man, this is serious stuff. So Jesus went through some serious emotional, mental, spiritual, every, everything that we are, he's got it, okay? He took it on and experienced it. So this is our king, but I want you to know that the prince of this world is already judged because that's when Jesus conceded to going through with not my will, but thine, thy will be done, like he said to his father. When he conceded that, he did go on to death. And uh, <clears throat> Christ died for our sins. But there's more than the death of Christ. You know, uh, in 1054, there was a declaration made by the Orthodox Church that, that uh, yes, Christ died for our sins, and the man on the cross, the crucifix, is very important. But we have to move on from there. He is resurrected. And Paul is very detailed in this. I said 1054 because that's when the Eastern Church and the Western Church split. The, uh, the Occidental or Orthodox Christian Church, the emphasis is not on the crucifixion. It's necessary, but that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is, emphasis is on the resurrection of Christ. Yes, he is raised from the dead. And Paul was very specific. 
if Christ is not raised from the dead, even though he died and suffered, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. Our uh, justification is false. And more than that, we're liars because we're saying that God raised him from the dead. If he didn't, if the dead don't rise, okay? So, <coughs> excuse me, so that that's, that's a really important perspective that Christ is raised from the dead. And so therefore, Jesus could say, when he that is come, when he has come, speaking to the Holy Spirit, okay, back to our, our symbolisms of, you know, euphorisms and stuff like that. Uh, when he, he, the Spirit of truth, has come, and he'll bring to our remembrance whatsoever things he said unto us, um, there's, one th there's three things he's going to do. He's going to convict us of sin. What sin? Every single sin we did, every lie we took, every cookie we stole, every, every you know, and believe me, it gets worse than that. Uh, no, those, that's not, no, of sin because you believe not that I am he. Could you imagine? Because every sin, every sin that we have committed, and I'm not touching on blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but every sin that a man commits is, is, uh, uh, it congregates, it is collected under the person of Jesus Christ. And when you say, Lord, when we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, plural, and to, uh, uh, to forgive us of all unrighteousness, which means it doesn't matter what he does. We don't have to name each individual sin. That's a trick of hell, all right? That's a right from the enemy. Oh, you didn't remember that sin. I don't want to remember that sin. Thank you very much. I want to put on the mind of Christ and I want to look at Jesus as the author and finisher of my faith and I want to wash my mind with the a, with a water of the word. It's much better than, oh, I remember this sin and that sin. That's, uh, that's from hell. Forget that, okay? Just look unto Jesus. But Jesus did say that the ultimate sin of that is Every, all of those little sins are like gathered under the person of Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe that he died for the forgiveness of those sins, well, guess what? Then they're still there because you can't get forgiveness unappropriated. It, I mean, you can't cash a check without taking it to the bank. God says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can be saved, but if you don't want to be saved, then if you don't want the money, if you don't want the benefit, then just tear the check up and say, bah humbug, I don't care about any of this stuff. I'll stand, for, I'll stand in front of God myself. But first of all, to be convinced of sin because they believe not that he was the Messiah or is the Messiah. And uh, second of all, of um, righteousness, because you see me no more. Why don't I see Jesus anymore? What, what's he talking about? Has he disappeared? Yeah, he has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is not walking on the earth anymore. He's not over in Jerusalem uh, with a bunch of guys following him around and feeding the multitudes fish and loaves. Jesus is gone. That was, uh, that was a one-time event, okay? Or that is his purpose of redemption. Okay, that was a one-time event. Uh, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You cannot take the word gave and extend it into a continual tense of giving. God is not giving his son continually so that we can be saved. It was a one-time event. Christ died for your sins and you get in on it, you either get it or you miss it. He is not coming a second time or a third time or a fourth time or repetitively. Hebrews makes it very clear in the comparison of sacrifices made. Sacrifices for the, or for the Jews were made annually over and over again. It's appointed on the man once to die and after this to judgment. And what that is actually saying in its real context is, Jesus isn't coming back to die for our sins again. God gave it, it's done, it's over. You get in or you get out. Take it or leave it, okay? It's not, he's not coming back with plan B. That was the only plan that there is. Okay, so, and the third one is that Jesus said, oh yeah, so where is he? He ascended. He ascended, what's that mean? A lot of Christians don't even know what the ascension is. They think Jesus is just like, I don't know, ethereal or mystical or mental or something like that. No, <coughs> the body of Christ was actually crucified 
it physically, biologically died. Jesus never died spiritually because it's not tenable for God to cease to exist. He was not born again in hell. That is, uh, let's see, who that came from? That came from um, Winford, who passed it on to Mary Baker Eddy, who passed it on to E.W. Kenyon, who passed it on to uh, Kenneth Hagan, who passed it on to the movement. Um, it's E.W. Kenyon. I don't even want to call it theology. It's Gnostic theology, okay? And uh, Jesus never died spiritually. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. There's been no break in the in the in the succession or or the secession of who God is. I don't mean taking them out like secede, okay? But in the sequence of who God is, there's never been a gap. God has always been God. He's forever from forever past to or to forever in the future. And the Jesus who is now raised from the dead is not born again. No, you know, he was not, but no, it's the same Jesus. He didn't have to be born again. How do I know it's the same Jesus? Still got the scars on his hands, his feet. That's what made Thomas a believer, okay? Thomas said, I'm not going to believe that. You guys just saw a, a ghost. You saw a spirit or something like that. No, uh, we didn't see a spirit. When Jesus came back, he said, Thomas, look at me, touch me. Put your hand out here in my hands and feel the scar. Look at my side, put your finger in it. Uh, spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have, okay? Because spirits don't. Spirits are spirits. Spiritual is spiritual. And that jumps way back to our first conversation. The devil's not having sex with women because physical human beings are made of flesh. They can't, they can't receive, receive, uh, they ovulate cyclically and they can only conceive when the correct sperm or seed is impregnated into the egg and then it descends and attaches to the uh, uterine wall and grows and then there's a period of gestation. A child is born, it's called birth. <laughs> it's called human life. It, it can't, it can't, it requires, it requires a human being. And Jesus is saying, so I'm not a spirit. I'm actually, uh, um, I'm actually flesh and bone. And the, the cool thing is, is that Jesus actually ate with his disciples. A spirit can't sit down and eat with you, okay? The devil can't sit and eat with you. He can't, he can't okay, he, he's fallen, he's disembodied, okay? But Jesus is not just, well, first of all, he's not a creation. He's the creator. Very different, okay? Don't forget, all the kingdom of darkness, the devil and all his rowdies, they're, they're, they're creation. They're just, they were created, okay? They're not the creator. They're not God. They're not even on the same field. They're not even on the same, I mean, they're not even on the same, same payroll. Believe me, it's very, very different. <coughs> but, we have a we have a king <coughs> who is has established who he is a wonderful kingdom here, <coughs> and uh, it's the kingdom of God. Now, I want to add one more thing, just sort of as a caveat to the whole whole thing. The kingdom of God is the rule of hearts over the the or excuse me, the kingdom of God is the rule of the spirit of God over the hearts of men. For now. Jesus is always, always going to have rule over my heart. But there is clearly a biblical teaching and scenario called the return of Christ. Now, some people just think that Jesus is going to return, end it, bang, zoom, it's heaven or hell, goodbye, and we go on. Uh, if you don't want any kind of millennial involved, but there are uh, a number of there are a number of indications in Scripture of something that we would call a millennial reign, not a spiritual reign only, but a reign in which Christ will actually dominate or have dominion over all the nations of the earth. He's going to rule them with a rod of iron. You say, whoa, I never heard about that. I thought we'd just die and go to heaven or hell. <clears throat> yeah, um, okay, well, let's read your Bible. <laughs> So I can say, read your Bible, read your Bible, spend a little bit of time in it. And when you hit things about are lions, are lions lying down with lambs now? 
uh, or is that just a spiritual overture of everything is going to be hunky-dory, peaceful, and the sweet by and by? Um, okay, but it doesn't talk about being peaceful and hunky-dory. It talks about a day of vengeance of our God. You know, when Jesus opened up the scroll, when he came back from the temptation, he went into the synagogue and he opened up the scroll and he found the place where Isaiah had written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach glad tidings. Um, and uh, uh, he stopped. Had Jesus continued one prepositional phrase further, he would have entered in the segment of Isaiah's prophecy that says, and the day of vengeance of our God. Okay. There are very violent promises. I'm sorry, there are prophecies, but uh, our concept of God as being just somebody who is completely a complete pacifist um, and, and tolerant of everything just for the benefit of being a nice guy. Well, number one, it totally destroys justice because you can't, you can't exclude justice from the character of, uh, of God. You know, it's like nowadays what's real popular in churches is to uh, say that grace replaces repentance. That's not found in scripture anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. As a matter of fact, the teaching, um, you know, is what enables the grace, excuse me, the repentance is what enables the grace. The very first message Jesus ever brought when he came back is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I say, oh, well, that's just thinking differently. Baloney, it means knock it off. It means stop it. It means, it means turn away from the wicked things that even your own conscience, you know yourself, you're doing wrong. Stop it. Just as well, I think differently now. No, think. You can, you can, you can, did you know that the devil is a believer? Yeah, he is. I mean, the devil, you know, how many times was Jesus by demon possessed people that saw him said, we know who you are. You, you're the son of God, the Holy one. Have you come to torment us before our time? Of course, the devil knows he's, he's, he, he's on a, he's on a schedule too. He doesn't have forever and ever. Ha. So anyway, but it, it bothers him a lot. That, that's why he's with great wrath cast down. Woe unto you inhabitants of the earth for the devil is cast down to you with great wrath knowing that he hath but a short time. Okay, you know, his uh, soup's on. I mean, for him, he's, <clears throat> he's stew, he's done. So anyway, uh, but if we think that God's character can be formulated by what we desire him to be, you have directly violated the second commandment. The first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before me, or there are no other gods before me, if you want. That's right, okay, got that one, check. I will have no other gods. But the second one is, and thou shalt make no graven images or any likeness unto me. What that means in, in today's vernacular you don't get to choose what I'm like. It's what God is saying. First of all, first commandment, I'm the only God. Second commandment, you don't get to choose what I'm like. You don't get to make me, shape me, define me. You don't get to do that. Wow. So it's like, what do you do with all these scriptures in context that paint God is a warrior, God is a... God is a just judge. God is someone who defends his people, defends the widows, defends the orphans. What's he do? You think he takes those other people that are attacking and just turn them around and say, now you be nice the next time. No, God is, God is, I don't know how to say God's character without just reading the scripture, but it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He is not somebody that you say, well, no, God is, God is love. He can't be fear. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, if you don't fear God, you're going to get in trouble. 
That's all. Okay, let's use respect or reverence or whatever you want to say, because a lot of times the word fear is just used to try to escape the idea that we need to reverence God. When God says something, he's not kidding. Moses struck the rock twice. He was told to strike it once. It cost him his life. Okay, it cost Moses his life. There is no fooling around with God. He's not somebody who is like somebody we know. I mean, it's, it's like it's very different. And we know God from the scripture. So he's a kingdom. He's going to separate the, the goats from the sheep. He's a kingdom. He has judgment in his kingdom. Have you ever heard of a, of, of a kingdom without justice? Without ju Well, you can't have justice without judgment. And without judgment or justice, he can't have mercy. I mean, you know, like if there's no justice, there's no mercy either. Yeah. Uh, but mercy even has a qualification. But as far as grace, uh, replacing repentance, no. That's nowhere in Scripture. For the grace of God teaches us that denying godly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and justly in this present world and godly in this present world looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. That's Jesus. He's coming. So the grace teaches us. What does that mean? Grace is an enabler. Why am I enabled? So I can do it. So I can act. So I can, so I can do what I need to do in the kingdom of God. So we have a kingdom in competition, but the competition is deceit, lies. The devil is lost. He's a loser. But if we don't know and understand that, we'll just go along when he says, hey, pick that up. You say, yes, sir. And you go do what you're told. No, say, no, no, I'm, I'm not. No, I don't belong to you. Okay. Remember B.B. King wrote a song, The Thrill is Gone. And uh, uh, of course, his context was different, but I've got the same context in my life. Devil, the thrill is gone. Sorry. I'm just not interested in you and what you have to offer anymore. I have found real life in Jesus. So what I did want to say is this, though, and I'm going to end because if not, I'm going on and on forever. <coughs> and the next idea of what I'm going to present is extremely long. I already talked about amillennial concepts and symbolic and, you know, um, or premillennial, and that is at Christ, uh, or, or a uh, postmillennial, or we're in the millennial. Uh, what I'm saying is I'm presenting you the word millennial as a kingdom, okay? Is there a millennial kingdom? And I'm going to say yes. There is a millennial kingdom, and there's going to be an amillennialist view and a premillennial and a postmillennial, and then you get into different discourses on rapture as pre-mid and, and post-tribulation, and when, is, when is, is the millennial reign combined or the time of Jacob's trouble come, and what happens, and when. It's called eschatology. It's just an order of the way things are going to happen, okay? There's a, a battle called Armageddon that's going to happen. There's going to be a millennial reign that's going to happen. There is a king of the millennial that's going to happen. Uh, there is a tribulation that happens during that time. There are antichrists, but there is also a parousia of antichrist. Uh, there is going to be an end. Uh, there is going to be at that time, at the end of 1,000, that's what millennium means, millennial, mil, as it quiere decir mil, nada más. Uh, so at the end of that thousand years, Satan, who was bound, is now loosed. Uh, you have other nations incited. You have different concepts. And I'm not putting a timeline on this for you now. <sighs> I'd have to have a wall to write all the. Well, no, you can buy yeah, you can probably buy a map that, you know, or buy all the maps that are different. They all have different eschatological scenarios of end time, uh, you know, and hit the book of Revelation. Some are preterent, some are current, or preterent means it's already passed. Current means it's now, or it's just spiritual, or some of it is interpreted one way and some of it is futuristic, is to come. Uh, <clears throat> there's a 
really too many to discuss here, but there is such thing called the millennial and there's a, 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 a lockdown, okay? How's that for COVID people? There's a lockdown for the devil for a thousand years and then he's released. And then there's a concept, what they call Gog and Magog. And I'm sure you've heard people saying that that's Gog is this region and Magog is other, which is now the countries of, you know, and they name different countries. Uh, if you want to put a time, you know, timetable to it, yeah, they have names, but their names have changed over, over, uh, you know, uh, Western Civilization 101 history and things like that. So, <clears throat> and then at the end of it, well, no, not at the end, what's called the penultima. Penultima means the events that are happening just before the end. At the penultima, we're going to have uh, it looks like heaven and earth are going to run away because the judgment throne is going to be established. I don't know where, but I know the mountains are going to flee from the presence of him that sits on the throne. I know there's a beast and a false prophet that are down inside this thing called a lake of fire. And um, I don't know if it's a geographical location or a, well, locations mathematically all you need is the intersection of two lines but i do know one thing that a uh, a person people cannot be omnipresent in every point in space and time with all of their being only god is omnipresent so where is this lake of fire that hell and hell and death are delivered and uh, even the sea it says i didn't write the book but the sea gives up the dead, okay? And they're all come before the throne of God and the books are open there. There's a set of books for everybody of what they've done and said and thought and wanted to do. Motives are all there and they're judged out of those books. Uh, but there's another one there also, another book, and it's called the Book of Life. And that's for the Christians. And if our names, if your name is found in that Book of Life, well then you're fine, no problem. If your name's not in the Book of Life, then you get what's coming to you, okay? And uh, that's not something you really want because the scripture ends by saying, and whosoever was found not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire and the smoke of their torment ascends up, ascended up forever and ever. And that's eon upon eon, no? And millennialist, or excuse me, no, wrong word, rewind, annihilist. Okay, think that you will only be punished for the length of time commensurate to the amount of sin. They say, well, you know, you only live, what, 80 years old and then you die and you have to spend eternity uh, in a lake of fire, you know, burning and suffering and in torment. Number one, you don't understand the gravity and the depravity of sin. And, uh, you know, number two, I didn't write the book. Eon upon eon is an idiom. It's like when Jesus told Peter to forgive his brother 70 times seven or seven times 70. You know, how many times do I have to forgive him? Seven times? And, and Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. In other words, an idiom just means permanently, always. You have to do it for, forever and ever and ever. You have to have an attitude of not grudging. You are to forgive, period. Now, what well, that's see, 70 times 7, 490, it doesn't mean that at the 491st time you get to hold it against them. No, it means forever and ever. And eon upon eon, or forever and ever, ever and ever, is an idiom. It's a phrase. It means forever. For an eon of eons, it's not counting something. It's not articulating a uh, 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 some kind of mathematical, um, huh? I'm sorry, I can't grab the word now, but it's empirical. It's not an empirical number, okay? It is actually, it just means it's, it's forever. God made man in his own image. You don't have an end, okay? You're not going to be spiritually eradicated where that you don't exist. We're made in the image of God. How can that be? It's like God committing suicide or God getting rid of his, his, failed, his failed copies or you know, shredding the data he didn't like off the printer. No, it doesn't work like that at all. So anyway, but what is a kingdom? The kingdom is going to be, it is now, it is the reign of the Spirit of God over the hearts of men, but it is also going to be extended or annexed or modified or whatever you want to call it, put on steroids, 
when Jesus actually comes back to earth. He's going to rule and reign, and you and I are coming back with him as part of his, his army. We're going to rule and reign for that period. The devil's loosed at the end. Gog and Magog, the scenario happens. It, the battle of Gog and Magog is not going to end, at, at least biblically, it doesn't end like, like the battle of Armageddon, which comes first. That's going to be the Lord himself. He's got a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. His eyes are a flame of fire. He's going to, to destroy the people that come up against him. How he's going to do it, I don't know. All I know is that I'm very confident he's going to do it. I don't need the particular. I don't need to know what's spiritual, what's, you, what's, what's, what's uh, symbolical thing. No. That's not, that's not my job on that. But I do know that for the last one, it's very simple. The beast and the false prophet are already in the lake of fire, and the devil's going in too, but Gog and Magog are simply going to be fire falls from heaven. That's it. 